Hi, my name is Victoria and I'm a thyroid cancer survivor. We are at the Thyroid Cancer Survivors Association Conference in Denver, Colorado. I'm here with Dr. Bowles. Dr. Bowles, thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. We're going to be talking about drugs and development for RAI refractory differentiated thyroid cancer. But before we get started, Dr. Bowles, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm an associate professor of medicine at the University of Colorado at CU. I take care of a wide variety of head and neck cancers, uh, but most of my patients are patients with radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer. And, and in particular, I take care of uh, patients who are needing other types of therapies after uh, radioactive iodine or surgeries. So before we talk about drugs in development for radioactive iodine uh, refractory disease, can you please first explain what RAI refractory disease means? Sure. Um, there are a couple of different definitions that people use for radioactive iodine refractory. Uh, so the most common one is people get radioactive iodine and what happens when you get radioactive iodine is usually you know, a week or two later people go back and we look to see where the radioactive iodine went. So if that follow-up whole body scan shows areas where the thyroid cancer did not take up the iodine, then we say it's not iodine avid or radioactive iodine refractory. So that's probably the most common one. Uh, the second one is if uh, someone got radioactive iodine uh, but their cancer grew anyhow within about 12 to 14 months. So that would be the second one. And then the third is if someone has received uh, 600 millicuries over their lifetime, uh, we assume that that means no more radioactive iodine is gonna be helpful. The fourth is a little bit more debatable, and that's um, if someone has a PET CT scan with a FDG, a FDG uh, and that is bright, that usually means that radioactive iodine uh, won't work, but that's a little bit more debatable. So why do some people have RAI refractory disease and how do they usually find out that that's the case? So it, it happens for lots of different reasons. So the most common one is that over the course of time, people's thyroid cancers tend to lose the ability to suck up iodine. So the proteins that are responsible for, um, for sucking up that iodine just get downregulated or are not very expressed which is why sometimes people will have radioactive iodine avid disease early in their disease course, but later they don't do it. Uh, the other one is there are certain types of thyroid cancers that are just less likely to take it up right off the bat. So um, for instance, a poorly differentiated thyroid cancer uh, is less likely than something like a papillary or a follicular to take up radioactive iodine. And then on the far end of the spectrum, something like anaplastic thyroid cancer just never takes up radioactive iodine. So when you say less differentiated, are you referring to medullary or they're just? Yeah, so there are, when we look at uh, cancers under the microscope, basically the more it looks like thyroid tissue, the better differentiated it is. Okay. So um, a kind of a typical papillary thyroid cancer, you can tell that it's clearly was originally a thyroid tissue. Uh, when things become less organized, they look less like the tissue that they came from, and we call that less differentiated. Got it, thank you. So then what are some treatment options that are available for patients with um, RAI refractory disease? Sure, the, uh, there are lots of different treatment options. So one treatment option, and honestly the one that we probably use the most is observation. Fortunately, many people with radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer don't need therapy right away. They may have cancer in their lungs, but it's growing slowly and they feel great. And in those situations, we often feel the best thing to do is watch people. Um, if a cancer is growing in just one specific spot, we'll still use local therapies. So sometimes that's surgery. Sometimes that's a different types of radiation therapy, like external beam radiation therapy. Uh, and then if a cancer is growing in enough different places or growing quickly enough and we think we need to use a medication to treat it, there are two FDA-approved medications that we use to, uh, in that situation. Are there new drugs in development? There are a bunch of new drugs in development. I think uh, the pace of, of discovery in oncology has been very fast over the last 10 years, really. So as of right now, the two FDA-approved agents are lenvatinib and serafinib. And those are medicines that uh, largely work on the blood vessel supply to the cancers. What we are focusing largely on now is, can or, uh, is therapies that are targeted against specific genetic mutations that these cancers have. So the ones that are out there uh, thus far, there are actually two that have just recently been approved. Uh, one's called larotrectinib and one's called entrectinib. 
and those are for thyroid cancers that have a uh, mutation or a fusion in a gene called NTREC. Not super common, but and common enough that we look for it in, routinely in clinic, and we have drugs to treat that now. So if you'd asked me that question six months ago, I'd say they were still in study, but they've recently been approved. Oh, great. Okay, so if a patient has radioactive iodine refractory disease, should they seek out care in a center of excellence? Sure. So the thyroid cancers are fairly common overall, and if you look at just the incidence of cancer in general, but most of them don't ever need to come to see medical oncologists, or uh, most of them are dealt with with surgeons and endocrinologists very early on. I think when cancers are getting to the point where they're radioactive iodine refractory, I do think it makes a lot of sense to see um, someone who's accustomed to dealing with those. Even in my specialty, medical oncology, uh, not everyone feels very comfortable with this particular diagnosis because it's not that common in their clinics. Mm -hmm. So we very routinely work with other providers in the community or uh, other providers sometimes even in distant states to help provide guidance or suggestions uh, to our patients who want to get care maybe closer uh, to their community but want to have some oversight from um, specialists who see a lot of this. Okay, thank you. Now, is there anything else that you think someone should know, particularly someone who maybe has just been told that they have radioactive iodine refractory disease, what should they know or what should they do? Yeah, so I think that the, the biggest thing uh, to think about when you have, when someone's been diagnosed with radioactive iodine disease is how quickly is the cancer growing and how are people feeling? Because just being told that you have radioactive iodine refractory disease doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do something dramatic right away. Sometimes it means you have to get watched a little bit closer Sometimes you have to start thinking about things a little bit differently, but it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I have to start one of these new medicines right away. Because we spend, we often will follow people with radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer for years before we ever have to do anything. So those are the big things, like how is this cancer affecting me on a day-to-day -day basis and how quickly is it growing? Because if it's not affecting you on a day-to-day -day basis and it's not growing that fast, we'll often just sit tight. On the flip side of things, if it's causing symptoms, or it's growing quickly, then we're gonna say, okay, let's start talking about what these other therapy options are. That's great, wonderful information. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowles, for joining us today. My pleasure.